Um, the focus of the origins of Wessex project is on the archaeology of the Upper Thames Valley in the early Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, it is a region uh, about which Bede and other sources, uh, early sources tell us. Um, a rather mysterious group, referred to as the Gavisse, emerged uh, in the 6th and 7th centuries. It was the Gavisse who formed the first uh, real kind of post-Roman polity <coughs> in the region, and they then went on to expand um, outward from the Upper Thames Valley, southward uh, and westward, uh, and then by the later 7th century to kind of rebrand themselves as the West Saxons. So the Gavisse are really the, the kind of the, the progenitors uh, of the West Saxons. And yes, some of you will recognize this map from John Blair's uh, book, Where Would We Be Without It? And now, the Upper Thames Valley, I should also just mention, was very much a contested uh, political frontier in this period, so hotly fought over between the West Saxons on the one hand uh, and the Mercians on the other. So against that kind of very broad uh, backdrop, if you like, um, well, the project's looked at a number of different things, but for our purposes today, uh, of interest um, is the investigation of two so-called great hall complexes. Um, found remarkably only a few kilometres apart, five or six kilometres apart. <coughs> uh, and we looked at these really to try and understand uh, why they emerged, when they emerged, where they emerged, and of course, obviously, um, the relationship between the two of them. Um, it should be said there hasn't really been any large-scale excavation at these sites yet, but just a little bit of preliminary work, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to introduce um, and talk about the first one, um, a site called Sutton Courtney, and then hopefully in about 10 to 15 minutes I'm going to hand over to um, Adam McBride, who's going to talk about the second site, uh, Long Whitnam. So just to orient ourselves, let me get the um, pointer bit right here. Okay, so here we are in the Upper Thames Valley. Ah, oh, wonderful Reading's actually on our map. Um, so, uh, and here we have, uh, well, the River Thames flowing here. Long Whitnam, which Adam's going to talk about, Sutton Courtney here, which I am now going to talk about. You might just want to note that we're just to the south of uh, a site, which I'll mention at the end, a town uh, of Abingdon. Now, um, since one of the themes of the workshop today is long-term chronologies, I thought it would make sense to um, begin <coughs> by kind of setting the the prehistoric landscape, indeed the prehistoric landscape without any question, I think, conditioned uh, the layout, indeed uh, the location of the Sutton Courtney Great Hall complex. So I'll start by um, just showing you a, an enhanced aerial photograph. I and mean, the crop marks at Sutton Courtney are very, very good. They're not quite this good. Um, <laughs> Stuart Ainsley did rather uh, enhance these. But the first thing that you'll notice, I think, is, is a, a Neolithic cursus monument. Now, um, we're pretty confident that was no longer visible in the early medieval period, but I think as Richard, would, uh, Richard Bradley would, would agree, it's uh, unquestionably the reason why uh, there was later in the Bronze Age a barrow cemetery, actually quite a large, extensive barrow cemetery, and you can see very clearly uh, some of the ring ditches here. And it is, I think, almost certainly because of the barrow cemetery that we have the Great Hall complex appearing where it is. You can probably just about make out a nice rectangle here with the Eye of Faith, another one here, 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 and so on. So those are the Anglo-Saxon um, buildings. So indirectly, we can thank the Neolithic Cursus Monument, perhaps, for, for the location of Sutton Courtney, but certainly the Bronze Age Barrow Cemetery uh, was a very important factor. So I hope you can see things a little more clearly here on this uh, image. So there you've got a series of ring ditches. There are many more scattered across the site, both to east and west, and the Anglo-Saxon buildings. One, oh, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. And three of those have now been investigated archaeologically. None of them has been completely excavated, but at least we've had a, a little look um, at three of them. Um, I should just mention it was, uh, I mean, this, this building was excavated some years ago, this one uh, as part of a, a time team excavation. Those from the UK will know this wonderful TV program. Um, at least they were able to get access to the site in a way that I was not. 
so uh, it's amazing, yeah, amazing what a phone call from Time Team will do for a landowner. Anyway, uh, so here we have a kind of schematic diagram, which I hope shows rather more clearly um, the relationship of the Anglo-Saxon buildings to the Bronze Age uh, ring ditches. So I think it's not uh, stretching things too far to argue that these three um, buildings appear to be more or less aligned centrally on the largest um, of the ring ditches. Uh, and then you have um, two buildings axially aligned here, the largest of which uh, cut the uh, one of the ring ditches. Um, I should just point out this building is um, about 30 meters long, which makes it so far the largest Anglo-Saxon timber building uh, yet found in England. So really a very, very large structure indeed. And you can see um, it cuts uh, the ring ditch. So one of the purposes of the quite small-scale excavation we took out was to really understand um, that relationship. And indeed, uh, when a section was uh, cut, it did become clear um, that that largest hole was actually had been cut through what was a standing, uh, upstanding earthwork, whether that was the remains of a mound uh, or, or a bank, uh, how eroded it might have been, who can say, but there was something visible there uh, when the hole was constructed. So I think in Gabor's sort of introduction to this workshop uh, that, that's been circulated, he talks about performative theatre and this sort of thing. I mean, one wonders when, when the thing was, was built, what, what, what was really involved in leveling out the remains of an earthquake, what did they actually do? But they had to do something before this um, building could be constructed. Okay, so we can be sure that at least some of those Bronze Age monuments were still visible and, and that therefore the prehistoric landscape uh, would have served to, to evoke powerful, if fictional, um, ancestors. This is a landscape with very uh, rich natural resources is sometimes described as the Upper Thames Savanna, so lots of rich pasture, but also very rich in, in supernatural resources. Um, we don't only have a prehistoric landscape here, however, there is also um, a, an early Anglo Saxon landscape that provided um, a kind of context or backdrop to the Great Hall complexes. <coughs> Um, Sutton Corny, as it happens, was the very first Anglo-Saxon settlement uh, to be recognised as such uh, in Britain and to, to be excavated in a, in a reasonably systematic way, way back in the 20s and 30s by, by someone called E.T. Leeds. Uh, and he uh, uncovered a huge kind of scatter of, of sunken huts, of Grubenhäuser, uh, covering a uh, gravel terrace, this field, up here, up here. Um, so, so there's a very wide scatter of, of these sunken huts. They date, they span the 5th century to the 7th century, almost certainly. Um, and we suspected that we would also find Grubenhäuser in this field with the Great Hall complexes. There were crop marks that were rather suggestive of this. And sure enough, as luck would have it, um, one of the time team trenches centered on, on one of the buildings here did uh, uncover um, a, a Grubenhaus. And indeed, rather conveniently, the building was actually had been cut into the Grubenhaus. So that raised the question, again, had they sort of leveled an earlier site or you know, backfilled an old Grubenhaus in order to construct the, the building? Um, I think almost certainly that was not the case. So we got a pretty good radiocarbon date from uh, some articulated animal bone on the base of this building, which suggests that Grubenhaus was already out of use by the middle of the 6th century. So I think that is essentially a coincidence, but there was earlier Anglo-Saxon uh, activity on the site. And there may be other group of of course, there that were contemporary with the Great Halls, we just uh, can't say. Um, also, uh, providing a, a certainly rather important context, I think, for the Great Hall um, complex, uh, is what was almost certainly um, a cemetery, an early Anglo-Saxon cemetery, in a field immediately adjacent to the Great Halls, just to the um, east. And some metal detectors found lots and lots of finds. I'm, I'm only going to show you a few, um, but enough to show that already, certainly by the middle of the 6th century, you know, there, was, there were inhumations there in this field. And by the late 6th, uh, early 7th century, there was at least one uh, and possibly more uh, quite richly furnished um, burial. So there's a whole um, little sweet little set of style to um, mounts, maybe from a box, maybe from a horse fittings, I don't know, maybe from a purse, hard to tell, but little, little style tube mounts, little um, 
gold filigree uh, disc brooch. Uh, so certainly a cemetery there in the 6th to perhaps early 7th century, and from the same field um, evidence of uh, gold working, so little uh, droplets of gold solder and tiny little snippets of gold foil. So that's the, uh, the early Anglo-Saxon uh, finds. In terms of uh, site dynamics, another one of our uh, themes. Uh, well, we can, we've had a look at the slide before. Um, we can see that the two largest buildings, as far as we know, the two largest buildings were um, actually aligned. Uh, uh, John, I think, has been the first to suggest that perhaps uh, where you see this, and of course this is quite common in Anglo-Saxon Great Hall complexes, there might be a, an element of procession here. And we can only say uh, that when excavation was uh, conducted over the eastern end, uh, the eastern end and the western end, there was no sign of an entrance here. So um, as far as we can see, there would have been no way of, uh, there wouldn't have been, as it were, two opposing entrances in those two buildings. There is, however, a major entrance um, at the eastern end uh, of that building, which was in itself uh, quite interesting. So there you have um, a close-up of the Great Hall, uh, and here the eastern entrance. Now, it's quite a wide entrance, uh, and in the middle of it, a massive freestanding timber post was set, clearly blocking off access to that in eastern entrance. Um, I wonder whether that marks that's a kind of termination rite, so when the building went out of use, when its life cycle, as it were, came to an end, the plunking of a huge uh, timber post in the middle of it you know, was, was part of some sort of ritual marking that uh, termination, indeed possibly the going out of use of the whole site. It's impossible to say, and unfortunately our efforts to date um, that post you know, failed. So we really don't know uh, exactly when that happened, but it does suggest a very deliberate um, act, moment in time when that building, well, at least the entrance, and I suspect the building, uh, went out of use. Now, what about, uh, in, a, in a sort of longer term sense, the site dynamics? Are we um, looking here at Sutton Courtney um, at a series of phases long-term development changes, remodeling, all of which we've seen at other um, sites of this sort. I mean, Limminge is, is the example par excellence. Yevering, well, I'm sure we'll hear about later. Um, pretty much all these sites where, where it's been investigated have shown signs of multi-phase development. I have to say, the three um, buildings that we've looked at so far, none of them has produced clear evidence of rebuilding, remodeling, modification, um, they seem to be single phase as far as we can tell. Um, and if we look at the plan of the site overall, well, we can see two things. We can see that um, that building, I'm sorry that doesn't show very well, but that building that was excavated um, separately a few years back um, is on a slightly different alignment from the others. Um, and from the aerial photographs, although not really from the geophysics, from the aerial photographs, you can just about see some other feature of apparently overlapping one of these westernmost buildings. But beyond that, um, you know, there, it, it, we can't see any evidence for multi-phase development. And to my eye, it's rather suggestive, at least the main buildings here, of a kind of single plan. Um, you know, that said, we have no idea how much time elapsed between the building of the first building in the Great Hall Complex and the last one. I mean, were they all done at the same time? Were they built over a period of, you know, uh, decades, and we, we just don't know the answer to any of those questions. <coughs> then before I hand over to Adam, I'll just say a few words about the, the afterlife of, <laughs> of the Great Hall Complex. Um, well, the building to the uh, immediately to the, so the field immediately to the east of the Great Hall Complex, I already said, produced the metalwork that was suggestive of a cemetery. Um, but it also produced 14 uh, shatters, these little silver coins, mostly dating to the, well, the, the, the second and third uh, decades of the 8th century. And I think that indicates pretty clearly that the cemetery, well, I say clearly, 
as clearly as it can in the absence of any excavation, um, uh, that uh, the cemetery was replaced in the 8th century by some kind of market or meeting place where uh, exchange took place. Um, so that's the sort of 720s, 730s. There is further evidence of commercial activity in the 8th century, um, even further to the east. So from a watching brief that was carried out about two kilometers to the northeast of the site. So let me just think. And so we're talking about, oh, let me get this right, around oh, about there, right up very near the river, as I say, about two kilometers to the east. A few sherds, I think two sherds, of Ipswich Ware were recovered from a series of, of ditched enclosures. I mean, we're never going to know very much about the site. It was a watching brief. The site is now gone. Um, but two sherds of Ipswich Ware right down near the river and near a place name, very suggestive place name, Sutton Wick. Um, so I think there almost certainly was in, in the 8th century um, a trading site there, right by the river. Uh, so I think that is, that is really um, very suggestive of commercial activity. Now by the 8th century, um, it's reasonable, I guess, to suppose that both the the Sutton Wick, or the Wick of Sutton and Sutton itself, the, the South Toon, were, were satellites of, of Abingdon Abbey, which if you remember, actually, we can see here, lay just to the other side of the river. Um, up here, we don't know exactly where, and indeed, the origins of Abingdon Abbey are very much shrouded in mystery. I mean, John knows much more about this than I do. It's, it's very difficult to be uh, precise about where it was and exactly its origins. But by the 8th century, I guess we can be pretty confident um, that both Sutton and Sutton Wick were associated with Abingdon Abbey. And just maybe one final point about the site, which is, I think, interesting in terms of its kind of, I suppose, maybe later political uh, developments. Um, this trackway, now called the Milton Road, it's a very ancient trackway, and indeed for, runs right through the Great Hall complex, um, but is also a parish boundary. So the site straddles a, a parish boundary, um, and I think surely that was a boundary long before it became a parish boundary. So it, it, it's in this sort of kind of interesting no man's land sort of um, setting. Okay, last slide, and then over to Adam. Um, so to the south of uh, the field that contained the Great Hall Complex and running right through it is an early Roman trackway. So founded in the first or second century, Bits of it are still visible today as an upstanding earthwork, so we can be quite confident that it was visible and presumably usable in the Anglo-Saxon, early Anglo-Saxon period. And remarkably, it, it connects Sutton Courtney to a uh, major centre of Dorchester on Thames here via a ford. Um, Dorchester, of course, was a, a very important early royal centre and the seat of the first bishop of the West Saxons. So it is striking that if we're asking the question why was the Great Hall complex where it was, well, I mean, I, th I think that trackway surely has something to do with it. So it connects it to Dorchester, but also connects it directly to another Great Hall complex uh, at Long Whitnam. And again, it runs right through the field with the Great Hall complex. So I think uh, almost more important in a way than the river, perhaps, uh, was this, um, this trackway connecting uh, all three sites. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Adam to tell you about Long Whitnam. So as Helena already mentioned, I'm going to talk about Long Whitnam, which is this sort of other twin site with Sutton Courtney. Um, so Long Whitnam was first identified as a possible early medieval power center um, from aerial photographs in 1975 and published as such in 1986. The identification of this site as a so-called Great Hall Complex was based on the large size of the buildings and the well-structured layout, which, uh, as I think we've seen with some other sites, uh, resembles this layout from known other power centers of the period. And uh, prior to this, and you can see again the, the relation there to Dorchester and Abingdon and Sutton Courtney, prior to this, the, uh, the site was known as the site of two um, significant early Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, Long Whitnam I and Long Whitnam II. Uh, which were both um, unfortunately excavated in the 19th century and not particularly well known. Um, since the identification of the Great Hall Complex, 
the site has been field walked um, and there have been four development excavations in the uh, near vicinity to the site but the Great Hall site itself has really not been investigated at all. So um, in in 2015, we started a new program of work, um, which started with a magnetometer survey of about half the site, the, the, the half of the site that we could access, unfortunately. Fortunately, you can see so a lot of the buildings are in a field that we can't access. The landowner's not very friendly. Um, and uh, so we had a magnetometer survey and a metal detecting survey, and then we topped it off with two small trenches uh, this last summer. And um, this will continue this summer with hopefully more, uh, well, definitely more excavation and, and hopefully a significantly larger area will be excavated. Um, so the, the discussion of Long Whitnam should really start with the Roman occupation. Um, uh, displayed here in the black um, crop marks. Uh, so we know from crop mark evidence and uh, from the recent excavations that we have a late Roman ladder settlement um, at Long Whitnam and uh, there's an unusually high proportion of fine wares at this settlement, which suggests that it does have some higher status occupation. Um, from, the, from the typology of the, um, of the crop marks, it doesn't, certainly doesn't look like a villa, but the high, the, um, the high proportion of fine wares suggests that it does have an above average uh, status for a rural site. Um, <coughs> So the, uh, the post-excavation of the last season is still ongoing, but um, we also have several um, query early Saxon sherds um, from late Roman features. Uh, and this suggests possibly some continuity of occupation. And for those of you who are familiar with the Upper Thames Valley, you'll know that there's actually a number of high-status um, Anglo- sorry, high-status Roman sites that have early Anglo-Saxon occupation on them. Um, they tend to be villas as well as uh, urban sites, but these these high status rural sites, these villas, um, they tend not to become early medieval uh, power centers. The occupation tends to peter out in the in the fifth and maybe early sixth century. So the kind of connection here between possibly a Roman and then an Anglo-Saxon site would be very unusual. Um, it's nearby, there's another villa called um, Barton Court Farm near Abingdon, which has um, which has definite uh, continuity, or as close as you can get, um, but that settlement appears to essentially die in the 6th century and then possibly restart in the later 6th century, but it definitely doesn't continue being, um, or at least not this level of high status site. So the, um, our knowledge of the 5th and 6th century is dominated by the Long Whitnam 1 cemetery. Um, so burial at Long Whitnam started in the late or 5th century. Uh, and from its inception, uh, it's heavily militarized and male-dominated. Uh, Long Whitnam has the highest proportion of male uh, weapon burial in the Upper Thames Valley. Uh, and until the late 6th century, uh, it consistently has among the richest male burials in the region. Um, so you can see some, some of the more um, standout artifacts from this, from this 19th century excavation. It's around this time, the, uh, the later 6th century, um, the so-called Great Hall complex uh, is believed to have emerged. So we have no direct dating evidence of the Great Hall complex as of yet. Um, but one of the development excavations in, a, uh, in the adjacent field has basically turned up a radiocarbon date of um, 570 to, uh, or excuse me, 590 to 670, um, which is really, I mean, consistent with the, with the sort of generally accepted um, period of occupation for these type of sites. Unfortunately, we really know very little about the Great Hall Complex at this point. Um, as I said, it was identified as a Great Hall Complex because of this layout, which is um, very typical, this sort of perpendicular layout, as well as the size of the buildings. So that, um, this is the point in here. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the, the largest building there um, is really, is about, is over 30 meters actually. So that would be actually bigger than the Sutton Courtney building. Um, but I'm not gonna really talk about the excavation results right now, but it's actually questionable now whether that's a building. Um, but the, uh, the other building kind of just, um, just northeast of it is 18 meters. Um, so again, all of these buildings are significantly larger than what you would find on a sort of typical settlement site of this period. Um, so uh, as Helena kind of already mentioned, unlike Yevering and Leminge, 
Uh, Long Whitnam doesn't have, well, she mentioned it with Sutton Courtney, but Long Whitnam also doesn't have any clear overlapping buildings. Um, sites like Le Yevering appear to have this almost perpetual cycle of rebuilding. Uh, and I think many of us would think that that's associated with this sort of success of need of each king to establish their own personal power and the, the uh, impermanence and personal nature of power at this time. But Sutton Courtney and Long Whitnam don't really appear to have this except for you know, that one instance of a small overlap of a very small building uh, at Sutton Courtney. And uh, so this may suggest that there is something different about the way power is expressed at these sites in the Upper Thames Valley or uh, perhaps something different about these sites uh, in particular. Um, it's possible that the dynasty in, the, in, in Wessex was stable enough that they didn't actually sort of didn't need to rebuild. Um, of course, we know about more internecine strife in Northumbria, um, certainly between the two houses of Dira and uh, Bernicia. But it could also be that um, sort of the, the way power is being expressed in Wessex um, places more emphasis on the, the um, continual long-term occupation of, of a single site and a single group of halls um, as opposed to rebuilding them each time. Or it may be actually that these sites are only occupied for one period, one king's lifetime, and then abandoned. Um, so, well, at this point we just don't know. Um, the large 5th and 6th century cemetery at Long Whitnam 1, which you can see pictured there, um, may have continued in use during the earliest phases of the Great Hall site, but there's no demonstrably 7th century material. There's a couple graves that are possibly extended into the early 7th century, um, but there's nothing that's definitely 7th century. Um, instead of this, a new cemetery appears, the other cemetery, Long Whitnam 2, uh, which unfortunately is very poorly known. We don't even actually know the exact location of it, although there is a barrow that, um, um, that we associate with the general location. Um, there, so we know uh, a general location from a description of the 19th century, and there's a barrow in the vicinity, and it seems likely that they're somewhat related in a position. Um, but we do know from the graves uh, goods that have survived that it's about 630 to 680 date um, for that cemetery, which is again relatively, uh, yeah, uh, relatively the same time period as the Great Hall site. So why here? Why, um, why would we choose this area for a Great Hall site? Um, like many Great Hall sites, there appears to be a prehistoric monument, and that would be the, um, the blue circle there, uh, the ring ditch that um, there's this very tantalizing alignment of one of the buildings with the ring ditch and actually continues on to the cemetery, as you can see. And also, it, it very much resembles the, um, the alignment of that uh, Helena was talking about at Sutton Courtney, where you had basically um, this sort of perpendicular alignment and a, um, and a ring ditch at the, the um, corner of that perpendicular alignment. However, um, from the aerial photographs, I personally don't see this ring ditch at all. Um, these crop marks are from um, the National Mapping Program. Um, uh, some of the other images I showed you earlier are my own transcription of crop marks. These are the National Mapping Program, and I don't really see the, crop, the, 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 um, the ring ditch. I haven't seen, I've seen all the aerial photographs in the Swindon archive. I haven't seen those from Cambridge. Um, but the point is, I'm not entirely convinced that it actually exists. Um, even though that is a wonderful alignment there. Um, but, uh, I mean, until we excavate it, we just won't know at this point. Um, the earlier cemetery, the Long Whitnam I cemetery, was almost certainly a major focus of ritual and communal identity, um, and earlier cemeteries are common features on other great hall sites. Uh, nevertheless, it's not entirely clear why this cemetery in particular would have been chosen. Um, as I mentioned, it is highly militarized and it stands out for that, um, but it's still in the same general wealth bracket as other cemeteries in this area. Um, it doesn't stand out massively so. Um, we don't have any evidence for a pre-Great Hall site settlement yet. Uh, there are, however, three um, possible and very likely sunken feature buildings that have been recently excavated. Um, one of them was excavated as part of the 19th century cemetery, and, and two others have been sort of clipped in a recent development excavation. And those are just east of the cemetery. So there's a chance that these are part of an earlier occupation um, like that at Sutton Courtney, um, but we don't have any dating evidence, and we just don't know. Uh, the crop marks give the impression that this is a kind of a virgin ground site, 
But as I'm sure many of you know, that um, basically the post-built buildings typical of the sixth century just simply wouldn't show up um, in, in, under the conditions um, for AO photographs. So I think it's very possible that we have even a spread of post-built buildings as well as sunken feature buildings. So um, if we compare the layout uh, with, uh, why is this? If we compare the layout with Sutton Courtney, you can see they're very similar. Um, they have this sort of L-shaped layout. Um, and, uh, and as Helena mentioned, there's a trackway essentially connecting the two sites. This is important because the current understanding of Great Hall sites sees this sort of loose network of regional power centers occupied on a semi-permanent basis by a traveling royal court. And the problem is that Long Wyndham and Sutton Courtney, again, about six kilometers apart, really are just kind of too close to be considered discrete stops on a royal circuit. Um, I think the idea is that they, they, they basically have the same territory to, to be drawing a, you know, the large net of regional, a regional power node with a large net of resources for a royal court. They're very close together, um, less than a day's walk. So it's possible that they were occupied at different time periods. Um, uh, certainly, you know, this has been suggested with Millfield and Yevering. Uh, but a recent viewshed analysis by Chris Ferguson um, as part of the Origins of Wessex project has shown that the viewsheds of these two sites do not overlap. And his uh, work in Northumbria has suggested that this uh, indicates that they have um, separate zones of control. Uh, and so it makes it less likely, or, or it makes it more likely that they were occupied simultaneously. If they had replaced one another, you would expect that they would have similar uh, contiguous zones of control. So. My recent conversations with Abby Tompkins concerning a similarly uh, exclusive view shed in the Avon Valley between the Great Hall sites of Long, Whit uh, Long Itchington and um, Manhattan Rock would suggest to me and her that these may be um, part of an ex a single extended um, uh, royal landscape, um, that they're actually being sort of, that these two sites are fulfilling sort of complementary functions within the same large extended royal power landscape. So on to the afterlife. We have no direct evidence of the abandonment of Long Whittenham, um, but like other Great Hall sites, it's generally assumed to be in later 7th, uh, early 8th centuries. However, um, the metal detecting survey turned up a rather fine piece of Anglo-Scandinavian -Anglo metalwork um, from the vicinity of the Great Hall site. And we have two other finds, the Middle Saxon Chateau um, there depicted, and a 10th um, century Anglo-Scandinavian bracelet. Uh, there's also a nice um, 9th century um, Nilo inlay strap end, but it's very poorly located. Um, there may be a better G reference, but I haven't found it yet. Um, but it seems it's very possible it comes from the same general area as the Shatta and the bracelet. Um, right now, the grid reference is just for the kilometer. Um, so uh, it's interesting these two, the, the Shatta and the bracelet actually come from the same general vicinity of this barrow that I previously mentioned uh, in, in association with the Long Whitnam II Cemetery. Um, and metal detecting on the barrow uh, uh, in the modern period uh, has turned up Georgian and Victorian coins, which suggests that the barrow may have been some sort of meeting place or trading place during the early modern period. And I think it's not implausible to suggest that it, the Barrow and the cemetery itself, the, the former Long Whitnam II, seventh century cemetery, um, continued on and formed this sort of landmarked meeting place, trading place along the Thames River during the middle and late Saxon period. Um, so on the one hand, we could say that the Great Hall site appears to be largely forgotten, um, but on the other hand, uh, it may be a false dichotomy to separate the Barrow from the uh, Great Hall site. It may be that this is, again, part of this extended royal landscape, and the Barrow is perhaps an assembly site associated with the, uh, with the, with the um, Great Hall site. And the, the sort of power of the Great Hall site had been transferred in the memory of future generations to that Barrow. So thank you very much. And, uh,